<laughs> whenever, whenever you're ready. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. So Labor Day. Happy Labor Day, everybody. Uh, grateful that all of you showed up on Labor Day. Grateful to have you all. So we've got a big whiteboard here, and Kevin and I spent a lot of time going through the top 10 takeaways from 430 episodes. And we don't know whether or not it's four years or three and a half years. Yeah, we're going to figure that out at some point. Yeah, we're going to figure that out. But it has been a very long journey. We've learned and grown more in the last four years than we did in the previous 26, 27. And we want to kind of break a thousand hours of personal development into one hour because between it's not just about the show and the podcast, it's the conversations after it. It's the conversations before it. It's setting intentions, paying intention, uh, attention. It's also who you meet. We've met some really incredible people along the way, many of which are in this room and uh, we're ready to rock and roll. You ready? I'm ready, man. You're sure? Yeah. Everybody ready? Everybody ready? I'm all hopped up on coffee. So this is my, I had a turbo shot right before this. This is another one. So this could go off the rails. <laughs> all right, here we go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another very special, as always, hyperconscious mastermind. I believe we're, believe we're in week 22. Yep. Um, as Alan said, I commend you all for joining us here on Labor Day. We kind of had a discussion through the team whether or not we should do one on Monday or if we should push it to Tuesday, but we said we were going to show up every Monday. And I appreciate you guys all showing up as well because it's personal development, right? Like we, we don't take days off because we're trying to get the best we can be. And I appreciate you guys doing that. Also, as Alan said, we're going to go over the top 10 takeaways from 430 episodes of the Hyperconscious Podcast. We have been blessed to interview some truly amazing people. And uh, we are going to share the top 10 takeaways with you guys. A couple housekeeping items real quick. So normally Amy and Tiff do an introduction and they usually close it out. So Amy's with family today, not able to be here. As you know, Tiff is in the house, but we're going to do it a little differently. We're just going to get right into it. If you have any questions, you can either put that in the chat and then Tiffany or Natalie will actually ask us that question if you don't want to have your voice on the podcast, because as you know, this becomes an episode. Um, but if you are willing, you can also unmute yourself and ask your question live. Do not be afraid to interrupt Kevin and myself. We encourage engagement literally anytime throughout the mastermind. All right. If, if you're going to, uh, like, just make sure you do Alan, not me. If you're yeah. going to, because like, Alan doesn't mind. I get, I get nervous. So number one, the number one takeaway, this goes all the way back to, I think it was episode 34. Yeah. And if any of you were listening to us back then, when we did this interview, I literally wanted to jump out the window before this interview because I was so nervous. This was our first big guest. Luckily, our studio was on the first floor. So if I did jump out, I would have been just fine. But Lori Harder, Lori Harder was one of our biggest interviews at the time. And we were terrified, but she dropped so much knowledge, so many pearls of wisdom. The one takeaway that really stood with me to this day is consistent 70% days are better than spotty 100% days. Okay. We all want to be consistent. We want to be productive, but a lot of us, what we do is we smash a day. We get a hundred percent day and we're like, okay, that's awesome. Then we try to do it the next day. And we do it. And then we do it for a third day. But that fourth day, we're burnt out. And we wonder why we're not motivated. We wonder why we're tired. Because you have been hammering it. And unfortunately, motivation wears off. So what Lori said was when she was writing her book, she found that more progress came from consistent 70% days than spotty 100% days. Now, let's do some math. I like it. Are you ready to do some math? I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> let's see if we can do this without jeffing it. Right. All right. So. Say Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, you hit 100% days, okay? Then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you hit zero. You got 300% divided by seven, which is what, 40, what do we say? 42%. 42%, okay. That's 42% if you're only relying on 100% days. If you did seven 70% days, you would be an average of 70%, 30% higher, okay? And that's like over time, that really adds up. And this is the other thing. You can consistently better your best. 70% of what you're capable right now is probably way higher than what an old 70% was. It's probably what your old 100% was. So focus on consistent 70% days. That, that all, like used to happen to us a lot. Mm. I remember like we got back from Brendan Burchard's event. Oh yeah. And we did like four or five 120% days. And I was off for a week, literally. I laid in bed for like a week. But 
as we got better and we got more evolved, those days became easier and easier. Like our trips now are easier and easier. Mm. So I would say that to you guys, like you don't have to get everything done every single day. Just make sure you're starting with the top leverage points, figure out what that actually is, and then see how that plays out over time. And this is really hard because it doesn't feel like you're winning sometimes. Sometimes it takes micro failure for macro success. I can't even tell you how long Kevin and I didn't feel successful um, when we were consistent. When you're consistently doing the little things that matter most, it doesn't feel like it's making a difference in the moment. But then you look back. I mean, we looked back a year ago earlier today, and it's, it's mind-blowing what can shift and what can change. Okay, so number two, Evan Carmichael. Uh, purpose comes from your pain. So it was, I don't know how long ago. Was this a year ago? Probably. Uh, no, not even. It was after. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was a little bit more than a year ago because this was before Florida. Exactly. Okay. So probably like a year and four months ago or three months ago, we went from Massachusetts all the way up to Toronto to visit Evan Carmichael in person. We went on his YouTube channel. He had a uh, episode called, I think, Drive to 10 Million. He was trying to get to 10 million subscribers. And I remember being in the hotel room and, you know, I was doing my flashcards. We did flashcards back then. And we were trying to prep our questions for Evan. And I remember he said that the truth of the matter is, is that your purpose comes from your pain. So his main purpose is to help entrepreneurs. And when he tells his story, he talks about not being able to afford anything. When he was an early entrepreneur, he remembers literally taking his team to McDonald's and they split a large fry because all of them were broke. Right? We see Evan Carmichael now, 2.5 million YouTube subscribers, gets paid $6,000 to come speak you know, at Your World Within Live a year ago today with us, like we don't see him eight, nine, 10 years ago when he had 900 YouTube subscribers. He recently posted a digital asset that I, I repurposed and, and showed to the team where four years into his entrepreneurial journey, he had 996 YouTube subscribers after four years of posting every day for five videos a day, every day for four full years. And he had 996 YouTube subscribers. So the point I'm making, your purpose comes from your deepest pain. When your pain, whatever it is that has caused you tremendous pain, whatever it is, you climbed out of that or you're still in it on your way out. When you climb, I often say this quote, the deepest, darkest holes, the tools that are required of us to develop in order to climb out of those also build skyscrapers. So my question for you is, whatever has been your darkest hole, whatever got you out of that, okay, that is also the tool that you can help other people with that. So for Kevin, it's when he was suicidal and he wants to help people have self-esteem and self-confidence. So his speech cultivating confidence, right? So for you, your purpose comes from your pain. What has caused you tremendous, tremendous pain? Maybe it was a limiting belief. Maybe it was, you know, alcohol abuse. Maybe it was whatever. Whatever that is, your purpose comes from that because we often talk about how if you never get to hell no, You'll never be all the way to hell yes. Fire. No, oh, thank you, man. Fire. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting because somebody asked me this on a podcast one time. They said, what do you, what did they say? How, does, how do you help somebody figure out what they're supposed to do in the world? And I said, well, it depends on what you're looking to do. But nine times out of 10, the only way you can help somebody else or the best way you can help somebody else is to have experience what they're, you're helping them with. Okay, so... If you want to start a podcast, I can help you with that. If you want to start a dog shelter, I probably can't. I've never done it. I can probably help you to a degree, but not at the highest level, right? For me and Evan as well, it's Evan's purpose is to build belief. That's why everything is hashtag believe, believe nation. He didn't have belief in himself. He wanted to quit the process, the journey several times. And now he wants to make sure that other people don't deal what he dealt with. That is for a lot of people, that is their thing. Like that is their purpose. And if you dig within yourself to figure out, look, growing up, was it growing up with a, without a father, without a mother, growing up around somebody who was alcoholic, having your own mental health issues, um, failing at relationships your whole life, right? Not being in shape and then learning how and wanting to empower others. Dig deep because you might find your thing in that as well. Mm. This, the next one's yours. Oh, two unless, you wanna, unless you want to just jump. No, no, I think, I think we'll do it in the order. Of course. Because otherwise I'll get confused later on. All right, so Jarek Robbins is number three, and it's success does not guarantee fulfillment. So this is actually a huge pain of mine. So this is very synchronistic that we put these in order. I didn't anticipate this though. So one of the things that I talk about often is how life is about choices. And I think what, what my deepest pain is, number one, losing my father at two years old, and number two, making poor choices. I've always believed in myself, but I 
having undying self-belief plus bad habits and bad choices is a, is a challenging combination. And here's the kicker. It does not lead to fulfillment. So what Jarek Robin talks, Robbins talks a lot about is that he grew up in an environment around all of the most successful quote unquote people in the world. Cause his dad, Tony Robbins, um, he was in environments with Seth Godin with all these people. Right. And he realized very quickly, first and foremost, everyone's either an example or a warning, meaning the things, the people that you look up to, they are really, really amazing for certain things, but there's other things that you're not seeing that they're really not good at. Right. And number two, success doesn't guarantee fulfillment. He has shown that he's seen some of the most successful people in the world who are literally not happy. And he's witnessed that since he was a young, a young boy. And when we interviewed him, he told this story about this incredibly, so he, what was the country that he I don't remember. It was in, I think it was in Africa. I forget where, but he basically saw this one guy who used to sweep this hotel uh, every single day, the porch of this hotel. And he said, I've never seen someone happier. He just did it with grace. He absolutely loved it. He watched the sunrise every single day. And Jarek, having grown up around all these super successful people, realized like maybe that guy's happier than some of the people who have all the success that I see back home. And that's really one of the things that I will say, and Kevin will say too, we've both been you know, significantly quote unquote successful, the car, you know, the beautiful girlfriend, the tons of friends, the tons of money, you know, the six figure salary, all that. But at the end of the day, it's not just how much money you make and how much success you have. It's the effect you have on others and it's your own personal fulfillment. And uh, Jim Carrey says this one quote that I listen to every single morning. He literally says, your effect you have on others, I can tell you from experience is the most valuable currency there is. Okay, you're only going to be fulfilled by two things, in my opinion, and this is one of the main takeaways from this journey, is growing and then contributing something meaningful that means something to you. So again, synchronistic. Purpose comes from your pain. Find out what that is. Use that to grow. Use your pain to grow. Your adversity is your advantage, and we'll get into that. And then contribute to others, which will be unbelievably fulfilling. I mean, when I get those messages from people saying that I've changed their life. It is my deepest why. I have a folder. I save them all. And I look at them when I'm, when I'm having a tough time. Uh, but at one point, I was very, very, very successful at a very young age, early 20s, making you know, all this money and stuff. And I was seen as successful, but inside I was hurt. And so you know, success does not guarantee fulfillment. Focus on both. I think I told this on the podcast a while ago, but the most fulfilled I felt, the happiest I felt, the most valuable I felt. I was walking around my kitchen one day and it was like shortly after I went all in on podcasting. And it was knowing that I didn't have to go to a job that I didn't like. It was knowing that people were literally listening to me on the podcast that I created like out of nowhere, just because I, I thought it would help. As I was walking around the kitchen, I felt so valuable in that moment. It wasn't about the money. Because I wasn't making any money at the time. It wasn't about that. It, it wasn't about any external things. It was about the fact, like for the first time in my life, I actually liked who I was. I liked what I was doing and I felt fulfilled. Happiness is, we create happiness. It's not the things that you get. It's the things that you create within yourself that actually make you happy. And if you can like understand that and start pouring into that bucket instead of like the flashy, the cars, the jewelry, that sort of thing, that's not going to make you happy. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not. And Obviously, Alan and I have experienced that. One last thing before Kev jumps to the sure, next sure. one. I, I told the story before, but in case you haven't heard it, it'll be quick. So Ella is my girlfriend's little sister. And she asked me this simple question once. She said, if you won the lottery, what would you do with that money? Imagine you won $30 million. And I really sat with that and I thought about it. I said, honestly, Ella, I would do the exact same thing I'm doing at a much more amplified rate. And if I'm honest with myself, I would be much more philanthropic and I would start my charity sooner but I really do want everything we're already doing at a, at a greater exponential rate. And here's what I would say in the past, I would not have said that I would have said, and she literally said, that's the best answer I've ever had or ever gotten with that question. Normally it's the jet skis and the boats and the houses and all that stuff. I honestly, this might sound hardcore, but I do think that those external material things are not ever going to make you happy. They might make, they might be fun and they might be enjoyable. And I think it's cool to manifest your dreams, but I really do believe that who you become and what you contribute is going to matter most. And if you can't answer that question the way that I did, like I once wouldn't have been able to, I guess just ask yourself why that is. Because if there's anything Kevin and I have learned on this journey, interviewing hundreds of people, 
it's the most fulfilled people are not necessarily the most successful. It's the ones that are having, that are the most in alignment. It's the ones that are the most in alignment. Fire. If you struggle with forgiving others or yourself, this next one is fire. This is, this was an absolute game changer for me. I can't even talk. <laughs> so recently within the, probably the last 50 episodes, we interviewed Dean Graziosi, uh, multiple New York best, New York times, bestselling author. I can never get that one right. <laughs> We've seen him speak several times on Brendan Burchard stages, super successful guy, podcaster, speaker, all that stuff. He said, if you're going, and this is a Tony Robbins quote. He said, I got this from Tony, but it changed my life. If you're going to blame people in your life for the bad things they did, you also have to blame them or give them credit for the good things. Okay. And this came from when I asked Dean about his father, because in this interview, he was very vulnerable about his dad and how his dad and him weren't necessarily um, of the strongest bond. And his dad wasn't always there and he wasn't always the greatest father, but now Dean literally takes care of him. He literally pays for his bills. He gives him like money to do what he wants. He literally takes care of him. And I asked Dean, I said, well, how did you, how did you get to that level of forgiveness when you, when you were able to forgive somebody who really wasn't there for you? And we went into kind of my situation with my father. I, you know, I spoke to my dad for the first time when I was 27, like for the first time that I ever really understood. And I was going through this internal struggle of like, do I want to build a relationship with my dad? Do I want to forgive my dad? What do I want to do with this? And he literally said, Kevin, would you be the same person you are today if you weren't in that situation? And I said, no, probably not. He said, would you have this podcast? I said, no, probably not. He said, would you be impacting people? Would you be coaching people? Would you be speaking? Would you be doing the same thing that you're doing today? And I said, honestly, probably not. And he said, so for everything that you blame your dad for that's negative, you also have to give him credit for the positive because he made you into the man that you are today. And for me, that's something I've always kind of reframed but hearing somebody as successful as Dean say that, like this guy is the top of the top, right? And that's a simple fundamental, but if you can really internalize that, and I don't know everybody's situation, I don't know what your family life was like, but for me, growing up without a dad was brutal. It was brutal. And if you ever have, it's sometimes you blame yourself. You wonder if you weren't good enough. You take that into you know, later into life and it manifests in different relationships. So hearing Dean say that for me was like a huge breakthrough. And honestly, I am grateful for the things that I've gone through because they did make me who I am. And Dean shared that with us and just super powerful, super powerful, especially like always remembering that because you can change like distance and time will go by. And sometimes I don't even think about it. I don't think about my relationship with my father, but when I do, it's important to understand and reframe it that way. Like I think that situation made me a pretty good man and I'm proud of that. So. Amen, man. And honestly, I think it'd be an incredible father partially because you didn't have one. And I know I feel Thank that you. way as well. And that's the thing. Every strength comes with a weakness and every weakness comes with a strength. And I think it's being hyper-conscious of both of those things. So Dean used the example of being empathic, being an empath. So like he used to get abused by his dad and he was very open about that and they have a good relationship now. But he was like, honestly, I'm really good at sales because I can feel other people's emotions. And the reason I can feel their emotions is because I always was freaking out whenever my dad would come home. And for anyone who's been abused as a kid, you know, you can relate. And you realize in hindsight, I always had this quote, super simple, but super profound. If you can be happy and fulfilled truly where you are with who you are today, you'll not only be okay with where you've been, you'll actually be grateful for it. The key is to get to that place. And when we're in unresourceful states and we don't like our life or we feel like we're behind, all of a sudden we start coming up with all these reasons why we're behind and we start blaming everything externally. Like, oh, if it wasn't for my tough past, if only I had a father, if my father didn't pass away, all that stuff, if I wasn't abused. When in reality, what if you flipped the script? What if you said the reason I'm so effing strong is because I had to go through all that shit? Like I often use the analogy of doing a triathlon and compared to the emotional pain I've been through, a triathlon is a joke, no matter how hard it is in comparison. My, my tolerance for pain is so freaking high. One of the only reasons, and we don't talk about that, this that often, but like Kevin and I's pain tolerance is like really freaking high. And like for anyone who's a bodybuilder, like, you know, you have to have a really high pain tolerance to be in shape at this level. And I'm not even saying anything about us. This is nothing about us. The point is, we grew up in an environment that was adverse and we climbed out of that. So again, the dark holes that you grow up in 
or that you fall into, that what's required of you to climb out of that hole is actually going to build a skyscraper out of your life. So every time you're, you're really struggling, like Dean says, like really struggling and someone hurts you, how quickly can you go from emotional pain to determination? And I think that's going to be huge. Now you get two in a row again. Uh, uh, Alan, we have a couple comments. I like it. Uh, we have somebody that says they love the Jim Carrey video you referenced. Oh. Mm. <laughs> and also, uh, they're really appreciating the triathlon references. I know who that uh, is. <laughs> and and want to connect with other people in that triathlon world. And... Um, and also, they want to reiterate what the note is on the third one about uh, uh, Jarek Robbins. Oh, uh, success does not guarantee fulfillment. All right, great. Thank um, you. Because, oh, absolutely. Thank you for reading those. So one thing I will say is I was outside of alignment. If you have goals, and I've said this before, if you have goals, right, but they're not aligned with your values and you're goal-oriented, you might get out of integrity with yourself to achieve a goal. I often use the, the analogy of like, if I intend to be a millionaire, which I do, but I don't know my core values, I might go work for a cigarette company as an executive or a consultant. See, I have a value against or for health and fitness. Therefore, I have to be against smoking cigarettes, nothing against anyone who does. But I'm not going to go work for a cigarette company, even if they want to pay me you know, tens of thousands of dollars to consult with them. Same with alcohol, same deal. I actually had that at one point. So I was so goal oriented from such a young age, but I wasn't as clear on my core values. And I, if I could go back, that was why I was unfulfilled. I wasn't unfulfilled because I wasn't successful. Being successful is great. That's wonderful. But if you're successful outside of alignment with your own integrity, your own core values, I think that's where things really start to uh, go Jeff, off the rails. Jeff. Right, it's to Jeff. Exactly. So uh, now number five? Yeah, I, I think we could. We could hammer it? I think we should, yeah. All right, sounds good. So this one's a good one. Okay, Chris Harder came on the show, and I also, I'm kind of kicking my neck here. Um, Honestly, deal with it, because <laughs> I've done it every time. <laughs> it's true, true. Okay, so spiritual, you have a spiritual and community-based obligation to make as much money as possible. This is an interesting thing. So Kevin and I, again, uh, hit the six figure mark at a very young age and we loved that, but we also were not fulfilled in the other areas of our life. What we didn't realize is that it kind of created an aversion a little bit to money and we had to reassociate our relationship to money. So Chris Harder helped us do that. He basically believes at his core and there's a great Mark Twain quote that says, you can never be poor enough to help someone else become wealthy. You can never be sick enough to help someone else become well. Right? So it's interesting because being wealthy will actually make you an amplified version of everything you already are. I think that because I wasn't proud of some of the character traits that I developed from a young age, I think I created an aversion to money a little bit. I went all in on money. That didn't end up doing it for me. So then I kind of went all out of money and I've had to rebalance and find now I use money, money doesn't use me, cash flow, all that stuff. But what Chris Harder was really trying to get across, and one of the main takeaways I want to give to you today, is that, first of all, money's a tool, and we all have a spiritual obligation to be wealthy. Because if we create wealth, and this really changed the game for me. Very quick story about, there's a book called The Richest Man in Babylon. Super simple book. I actually gave this to one of my mentors, and he, uh, very wealthy man. And he literally printed out copies, highlighted it, sent it to 12 of his favorite humans. No joke. That's how good this book is. He's like, why doesn't every school teach this? I'm like, I know. Richest man in Babylon blew my mind with one simple analogy. Let's say Kevin and I, in a hypothetical world, he pulls a million dollars out of his bank account. I put a million dollars out of my bank account and we build a palace. Okay. It's a gorgeous palace. What's interesting is that everyone who builds the palace, the masons, you know, the architect, the gardeners, the landscapers, they, the money doesn't go away. They all get that money and that feeds their families and creates their dreams. Guess what? The palace is still worth $2 million. As a matter of fact, not only that, but it appreciates in value if we take good care of it. So a year later, it's worth 2.5 million plus the 2 million that was already with all the workers. And on top of that, everyone in the neighborhood's value went up too. Wealth creation is not a zero sum game. It's not a poker tournament. Kevin does not have to lose for me to win. That is BS, okay? And when you realize that, 
then you start to let money flow through you for others. Dave Meltzer talks a lot about this. This is the thing. Check in with your relationship to money. Chris Harder has a podcast called For the Love of Money, and he has mastered money. It's very clear. If you listen to that episode, it's absolutely clear. Kevin and I really needed to understand, okay, not only do we want to make more money, we have a spiritual obligation to make more money because we know we're going to do good things with it. And that's the takeaway for that one. I would say this too. If you're emotionally driven, a couple, a couple different things. If you're emotionally driven, uh, if you're afraid of sales or if you have a negative association with money because of your past, that's not necessarily real. Like just because maybe you grew up in a family that didn't either didn't value money or maybe made you feel bad about money or you worked at a company that made you feel bad about money. Like at the end of the day, money is a tool. Money is a form of currency. It's a form of energy. What you do with money is more important than the amount that you have. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can lock that in, like by that definition, the more money Alan and I make, the more of you guys we can impact. It's that simple. We are actually selling ourselves, you guys, our partners, our team members, and the world short by not making more money because that means we can't impact more people. When you put it that way, it sounds a lot better than saying, I need X amount of dollars for this. Like, do we need any certain amount? I mean, enough to live, but the more that we have, the more people that we can impact. And that's one of our greatest inspirations. Yeah. Money does not buy happiness, but it does buy choices. And if you make good choices, that can buy happiness. Okay. And that's the thing. I had money before I didn't make good choices and I wondered why I wasn't fulfilled. It wasn't the money that was the problem. It was my poor choices. Right. So, uh, okay. You got another one because I got another one in a row. Set it up okay. this two way. In, I don't two in a row here. You know, I'll just hang out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you've probably heard me tell this story before. So Bronnie Ware came on the podcast and when I got in my car accident at 26 years old, I was sitting in an armchair drinking whiskey, questioning everything. Um, for those of you who don't know, I know most of you probably do, but my father passed away when he was 28 while I w when I was two. And so when I was 26 and I got in this bad car accident, normally I show the photo because this car was very totaled and we're very blessed to be okay, my cousin and I. But I was questioning everything. And I say this simple quote now, every show I go on, Mauricio, you're in the house. I said this on your show. We cannot see the stars during the day. They're always there, but sometimes it takes the darkness to see clearly that which we simply could not within the light. When you're in emotional pain, you're going to wake up to the things you were not paying attention to before. I had a tough check-in this week with Emilia. Not a bad one, but I got some feedback that I didn't expect. I was in a little bit of emotions. I noticed some things I wouldn't have seen before. As long as you keep your eyes open and you sit in the pain and you don't escape it. When you're in emotional pain, you are going to either escape into a vice or develop a virtue. I found a star when I was in emotional pain after that car accident. And that star was Bronnie Ware's book. Bronnie Ware wrote a book called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. And it basically, she worked in hospice for eight years with the terminally ill. She basically thought her job was to take care of them physically and medically, when in reality, her real job was to listen. And, and she says this all in the book. She also has a fire TEDx talk. She literally noticed these same patterns of I wish, I wish, I wish. And that's why I resonated so much with that book because I had so much regret when I got in that car accident at 26, realizing that that could have been it, just like it was for my dad. And so now, to this day, I have a flashcard in my pocket with the top five regrets of the dying. The number one regret of the dying, according to Bronnie Ware, is I wish I had lived a life true to myself and not what others expected of me. Now, here's the takeaway. After that interview, first of all, I was a huge fanboy because this was four years later. And I was like, oh my God, Bronnie, like, you know, I was just such a huge fanboy. And what I realized after that, because I was in a very uh, tenacious um, phase, and I talked to Kevin about this afterwards, and I said, you know what's interesting? Is that Bronnie Ware actually changed the world, especially my world, with her gentleness. If you go back and listen to that episode, it's episode 180. She's such a gentle soul. Like, some people are very, like, tenacious, get after it, self-discipline, grind, grind, grind. Like I definitely fall on that end. But what I realized in that moment with Bronnie is that I can change the world with my uniqueness and she changed the world with her uniqueness. And I remember telling Kevin, like, I'm not going to change the world with my gentleness. Like I understand that, but Bronnie Ware did. And so if you're out there right now and you're listening to even Kevin and myself, remember, these are principles from our perspective. You have your own unique version and there is a way to change the world with your gentleness. And she did it. 
Yeah. And this, honestly, if, if anything, lean into what your uniqueness is, maybe it's something completely different. Maybe it's a completely different business model. Maybe it's a different message, whatever it is. If it hasn't been done, so a couple of things. If it's been done, maybe you can do it better. If it hasn't been done, you could be the first to do it. Right? Like those are always options at the end of the day. Those are always options. I don't have much more to add on this because you did a great, like, a strong work on it. Thank you, man. Yeah. Ronnie, that was a long time ago. Yeah, it really was. So I don't know that I would go back and listen to that episode, <laughs> but it's probably valuable. I don't, I'm going to have to listen to it because 180 episodes ago, or no, 180, that was. 250 <laughs> episodes ago? It's crazy. It's a long time ago. It's right. a long time ago. Number seven, the one and only David Meltzer, our mentor. And at this point, he has changed our lives. Uncle Dave. Uncle Dave. <laughs> he, for those of you who listen to us and Dave, we think he thinks we're from Canada. We're not sure, <laughs> but we haven't told him yet because we're afraid he'll get mad. Full circle, Evan Carmichael sent him a photo when we went to visit Evan Carmichael, sent him a photo, a selfie yes. from Toronto. And I think in his head, we were from Canada. Although recently he did say, sorry about the Celtics. Something about the Celtics. Yeah, so I so. think we're good now. So uh, <laughs> Dave is very spiritual. He's very macro. Dave does not care about today. Today doesn't matter. It does. But to Dave, everything's going to happen. Just a matter of when. And to Dave, time does not exist. He makes this, his decisions based on if time wasn't a real thing. What does Dave say? Everything you want is already out there. It is your job to clear the corrosion to it. What does that mean? That means when you decide, I want to have the greatest relationship, right? Alan and I decided that. I'll mm -hmm. speak for myself. Taryn, my beautiful girlfriend, is in here. I decided that I wanted to have the best relationship. That relationship became possible somewhere. Whether you believe in God, whether you, whether you believe in the universe, wh whether you believe in a purple dinosaur that lives in the sun, whatever it is you believe in, that, His name is Jeff. Jeff. <laughs> yeah, Jeff the dinosaur on the sun. That then became a possibility. Now it's your job to get rid of the junk blocking you from getting there. Okay, it's that simple. Now, is it that simple? No, it takes a ton of inner work. It takes a, don a ton of knowledge. But you're already capable of achieving whatever it is. You just have to figure out the stuff that's holding you back. Maybe for you, if it's having the best relationship, it's your ego. Clear the corrosion. Get rid of that crap right? The, the analogy he uses is imagine we've all had that cell phone charger that like is frayed because you bend it too much and it, it, it stops working. That's corrosion. That's corrosion. You have to clear that. You got to get a new charger and plug it in. Boom. hundred percent. We all have that in our life somewhere and it's our job to clear it. What you want's already out there. It's already out there. Once you decide it's your job to get rid of the crap. Um, one brief example of this is when I decided to go all in on fitness after that car accident, there's a man by the name of Nate Smithson, close friend of mine, dear friend of mine, fitness coach of mine. Uh, I actually talked to him, I think probably four days ago for like an hour and a half. We keep in touch, but he lived three minutes down the road from me. He grew up three minutes down the road from me. The moment I decided to be the greatest natural aesthetic men's physique fitness model on the planet, that's just a dream in my heart, right? All of a sudden, I notice Nate. And then I'm afraid to go talk to Nate because Nate's very intimidating. He's 6'4 and a monster. Oh, he's jacked. Yeah. And the corrosion is the fear. I, I notice Nate. I want to be in shape. He's a personal trainer. Being friends with him would help me get in shape. I feel pulled to go talk to him, but I have a fear. I have a fear of asking a dumb question, looking bad. He's, you know, uh, an intimidating human. The corrosion is fear or ego. So that's one tangible example of someone who lived three minutes down the road from me. But once I had the goal and decided, just like Kevin decided to have an amazing relationship, until you consciously choose, I'm going to go achieve this thing, the person's places, things, and ideas around you necessary to achieve that thing are not going to show up in your consciousness. I always think of it like when you create a checklist, so we've gone through the system of success, creating your own system of success. That is literally your job not to screw that up. Those are the things that you decided are the most important for you to accomplish your goals. It's your job not to screw that up. That's the way I think of it. You've just created a step-by-step -step process from your current level of awareness that's mm -hmm. going to get you to your goals. Just continue doing it, right? We've never stopped doing the podcast. You guys would not have listened to us you wouldn't be listening to us. You wouldn't be working with us if you're clients if we didn't clear the corrosion. 
in terms of like, I don't know, man, I feel like we're not as good as we need to be. That, that's corrosion. The ego between Alan and I, like we always drive to five. That's corrosion. We've never missed an episode. It's our job to keep showing up. And if we do five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the road, everybody will be like, oh my God, how did that happen? We cleared the corrosion consistently. We stayed on the path for long enough. Most people don't, right? So it's a, it's a mixture of sorts. Mm. You good with this? Yeah. Okay. Number um, just a, a few hammer, comments. Hammer, hammer. <laughs> uh, so there's more of the discussion about cycling. Uh, that really sparked some discussion in chat. Interesting. Um, but uh, they want to say thank you for the discussion of money growing upward. Ah. Uh, that that episode with Brawny was still very valuable. Appreciate that. Um, love the part about the top five regrets of uh, dying, um, of people dying, and then they'll be sure to check it out. So mm-hmm. that's for anyone interested in those regrets. Uh, it was Kevin's idea to do this, and I do it every single day now. Uh, I reverse engineer regret every day. So the first regret is I wish I'd lived a life true to myself. Second regret is I wish I hadn't worked so hard on the wrong things. Third regret is I wish I had the courage to express my true feelings. That one's a hard one. The fourth one is I wish I stayed in touch with my friends. And the fifth one is I wish I had let myself be happier, like allowed myself to be happy, right? We can all choose in this moment to be happy. Kevin said, why don't you reverse engineer regret every day? And I was like, oh my God, great idea. So now my journaling habit is I ask myself based on yesterday, every morning I do this, um, how well did I stay true to myself is one of them, right? So if you're interested, Bronnie Ware's book is absolute fire. Again, if you've ever dealt with regret in your life, usually it comes down to one of those five um, or some combination of them. Okay. You ready now? Ready to rock. That was good. I like that. Thank you, man. And also appreciate the credit. Oh, of course. Appreciate the credit. He had some really good ideas. Look, some of my ideas are fire. Other ones are not so good. The best idea he ever had was me reaching out to you. Yes. It only (laughs) took too long. Yeah. All right. Number eight, the one and only Mark Metry, who has actually become a very good friend of ours. Uh, I rap with him on a weekly basis. Mark's a great dude. Such a great dude. 23 years old, like literally changing the world. So for the longest time, Mark thought that he was shy. Okay, he now speaks in front of thousands of people. His podcast has 12 million downloads, like in the top 100. He's literally changing the world. He has companies that he does their podcast for, makes tons of money. Like genuinely, Mark is at 23 years old, changing the face of the world. Amazon docuseries, like a million different things. But he convinced himself that he was shy. He had a really bad case of social anxiety. He wrote a book called Screw Being Shy. Be careful of your labels is what Mark Metry taught us because for the longest time, he and other people convinced him that he was shy. Alan talks a lot about uh, being good at math. The label for Alan was somebody who's good at math. And he would have been, he's far more likely to follow a path that has something to do with math because he's good at it. We've all been labeled as something. The funny one, the shy one, the loud one, the brave one. Okay, whatever. And there's some not so nice labels as well. What what just happened? What just jumped off the table? (laughs) Um, But if you can figure out what are the labels that I've given myself, what are the labels that I've adopted from other people? It probably isn't who you really are. It's probably just your way of coping with uncertainty or fear. You're, are you shy? I wouldn't say that you're shy. I would say that you're afraid of being outgoing. Doesn't mean you're shy. You just have to change that behavior, right? Start, this is something right here. How many of you, when you're walking down the aisle with somebody in the supermarket, look in their eyes and they look back? That almost never happens for me. I will look at somebody and they'll look down. They've convinced themselves that they're shy. First step for them to prove that they're not, start looking people in the eye. Completely different life. You're not shy. You're just afraid of certain things. That's it. There's a million examples of those, right? Um, I could never be a professional speaker. That's a label I had. Now I speak. I could never be a podcaster because I'm not a good speaker. That's a label I had, right? We're, we're all, we all live through our labels. So when you change your labels, you'll change your life. Mm. I wrote an article early on of uh, the power of self labels and, and Mark Metry is so fire on this. That's why he has a podcast called the humans 2.0 podcast, because there's a 2.0 version of you that doesn't have this limiting tethering to these limiting beliefs. So I wrote an article called, uh, or basically that talked about trading in my label for alcoholic to bodybuilder. 
And I remember I've said this before, I got all that, like, oh, you're a bodybuilder now, all that stuff. So once I became a bodybuilder, here's, here's what I would say. Imagine you got in a bad car accident and you're in a coma. And when you wake up, you, you have all of your friends and family around you and they're all telling you, it's okay, we love you. But before this car accident, you were a Navy SEAL. Okay, you had no memory whatsoever. You would hold yourself differently. I often get a compliment, like they ask me, are you in the military? One, because I look so young. Number two, my posture is a big focus. Lately, it's been slop sloppy. Mm -hmm. But no, it's been good. you would hold yourself differently. Why? Because being a Navy SEAL comes with a standard. It comes with, a, with a, an empowering label. Okay, versus let's say you're a bus driver. There's nothing wrong with bus drivers. Please, no one take offense. The point is this. Your identity is made up. When I was told you're good at math, I naturally was like, I'm good at math. And I just did more math and then got good at math. Oh, you're not good at English? Oh, I avoided English Na naturally. What? Oh, now I'm bad at English. So everything you believe about yourself is actually kind of made up. Okay? When's the last time you revisited that? Oh, I'm tall and lanky. Oh, I'm a good, I've got a good running body, but not a good swimming body. Or I've got a good swimming body, but not a good bodybuilder body. It's all nonsense. The point is you get to be who you choose to be. But are you choosing based on the past or based on the future you actually want? Hmm. Fire. Thank you, man. You're up. Oh, I'm up again. Yeah, you're up again. <laughs> Taking the whole thing here. We got 13 minutes, 57 seconds. We're okay. hammering. We're hammering. Right on, we, right on schedule. Not bad. Not bad. Number, number nine, Anthony Trucks, personal favorite. Anthony Trucks is an awesome, awesome guy. And what I like about Anthony the most is his story. He came through tremendous adversity. And that's the takeaway here. So the number one takeaway from Anthony Trucks episode, your adversity is your advantage if you have a growth mindset. That's the key. And for the longest time, I would say this, like your adversity is your advantage, right? The pain you're going through today, AK, your close friend, Anthony's, we actually met AK through Anthony. Yes. Which is awesome. And uh, the pain you're going through today is actually the training ground to become the person who's strong enough to handle things in the future. But you either step up or shell up. If you don't believe that you can overcome this thing. So let's say, Let's say I have a check-in with Emilia and let's say she gives me some tough feedback um, about one of the ways I'm showing up in our relationship, okay? If I have a belief that I can't get better, aka a fixed mindset, I'm going to start freaking out and I'm going to be like, no, whoa, like I, what's this about? And I'm going to start blaming other things. I'm going to start making excuses. But if I believe that I'm capable of improving, changing, growing, capable of working on it. Of course, now every challenge becomes an opportunity. See, fixed versus growth mindset. Anthony Trucks has been through the most heinous shit you could possibly imagine. Okay. And he's open about that. That's why I can say it. He grew up in foster care, licking bottoms of shoes, chasing chickens for his meal, like just horrible stuff. Okay. Most stuff that most of us couldn't even fathom. And he's literally unbelievably successful, but it's because he never let it stop him. One of the things I'm most proud of in my opinion, is just the fact that like, I always had a bright future. No matter how dark the present got, no matter how dark the past was, I always had that bright future. And I still do. No matter how dark it gets, I still do. It's still there. And I think Anthony held on to that too. So your adversity is your advantage if you grow from it. And at the end of the day, that's like, honestly, every single one of these people, almost every single person we've ever interviewed has been through something. David Meltzer lost $100 million. Mark Metry was suicidal. Um, Dean Graziosi dealt with an abusive parent. Jarek Robbins got malaria. Jarek Robbins got malaria. Evan Carmichael literally was, was super broke. Right? We've interviewed so many people who have been to the bottom of the bottom, but I, I'm like a firm believer that that's one of the reasons they're willing to shoot so high because they know what it's like to be at rock bottom. And when you know what it's like to be at rock bottom, you know that there's the total opposite of, of that out there somewhere. When you've seen the worst, there's not really much further to go. This is the Phoenix from the Ashes. We talk about PTSD, very real thing. We don't talk enough about post-traumatic growth. Lori Harder, and again, the reason we can talk about this is they've all come on the show and opened and told their stories. Lori Harder was raped as a young girl. She was literally, I, I believe, I don't know if she was kidnapped or, or what, but maybe that was Cheryl Hunter. But I, I know yeah, Lori Harder dealt with sexual That's why I didn't, because sure. I didn't remember exactly the story. Cheryl Hunter, she was the Coca-Cola girl in the 90s. She was, she dealt with sexual abuse. I think she, she was literally kidnapped. kidnapped yeah. yeah. Like it's, it's, but these people decided that, look, 
rather than let this control my life in the bad way, I'm going to let this motivate my life. This is going to be the inspiration. This is going to be the rocket fuel. We all have that opportunity, but uh, it's not always easy. I mean, it's definitely not easy, but we have to decide at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. All right, number 10, Dr. Jen Esker. She is at DocGenFit on Instagram. She is one of the sweetest people, such a sweetheart. We saw her speak at Brendan Bouchard's event, and then we ended up interviewing her after that. And then we also interviewed her recently. One of the things, and for like Doc Jen, I think she's got like 360,000 followers on Instagram. She's very famous, very well connected. She said that a lot of people would meet her out and then they'd find out who she was and then they would change their tune. They'd want to be really good friends with her. They'd want to collaborate. They'd want to have all these opportunities with her. Make sure the people in your life, and this is the takeaway, make sure the people in your life are in your life for the right reason. Especially like when you're at her level, there's a lot of people that are around because they want something from you. Now, maybe we don't have, you know, anybody in this group, maybe we don't have 400,000 followers, whatever. There's still people in your life that are around you for maybe the wrong reasons. Maybe they're around you because of what they can get, not what they can give. And guys, this is a, like, this is one of those ones that's really hard because it involves other people. But I will preach this until the day I die. If the people in your life are not helping you, they shouldn't be in your life. Most people are because of nostalgia. Are the people in your life the best for your future or the best from your past? That is the question I will always ask because it's uber important. Um, and especially as you grow and evolve, right? Like if you want to become the best version of yourself, you want to have the best version of others around you. Mm. The reason why people are in your life is so, so, so important. Uh, the last thing I would say about this one, number 10, is she was talking in particular, everything Kevin just said was valued, but especially your inner circle especially your inner circle. So like if you're going to network, which might as well be, I've told people, get rid of the word network and start saying strategically building relationships. There's nothing wrong with strategically building relationships, but your inner circle, your true few, that are going to be there for you in a pinch. That should be genuine based on who you are and your character, not your perception in the marketplace. The real ones. The real ones. The real ones. Mm. You got uh, Captain Brandt. Oh, that's right. So we've got a bonus. So that was 10. That was 10. And uh, we now have three bonuses. We, we do have three, but we have a bonus, bonus, bonus. The last two are the most powerful. I think so. Um, technically the last one. I'm just joking. All right. Mind so right. Brant Pinvidic, he wrote the book right behind me called The Three Minute Rule. He spoke on one of our stages. Uh, he's been a dear friend and mentor of ours. Honestly, hilarious, hilarious guy. We've got stories for days. Yeah, he is. He is hilarious. Um, the key takeaway was when he was on stage, he did this one simple thing that I will literally never forget. And I think most people who have been to Top Notch Live won't forget this either. He put up a slide that said, Katy Perry is the most successful artist of all time. And he said, every single one of you in the audience with that bold statement, AKA marketing is trying to prove me wrong right now. What about Michael Jackson? What about, you know, this person, that person, Eminem, right? And he said, instead of that, Instead of that bold marketing statement of, you know, fit in 30 days or, or abs in six minutes a day or any of that nonsense that truly just is nonsense. He said, instead, why not convey information that's valuable? So instead, the next slide, it was just seven statements of value, bullet points. And it was Katy Perry sold out a concert with 85,000 people, biggest stadium of all time or something like that. It was just these statements, these facts, Okay. Another statement was she had a, a, a platinum album or, or the number one hit signal, single for, you know, X amount of weeks or whatever. The point is, is, okay, the first slide I showed you with that bold marketing statement, you're all trying to prove me wrong. The second slide, you're reading this, this factual information and going, holy crap, is Katy Perry the most successful artist of all time? So the point is this, and I do a training called Selling with Integrity, and this is the thing. This is why storytelling, this is why influence needs to be not these bold claims. Like if I'm a business consultant, I can literally say to you, I can help you scale your business online, no problem. But if I tell you a story about how I helped a client scale their impact and business online, that's going to be much more impactful. Why? Because one of them I told you, the other one, you drew the conclusion in your own consciousness based on the information I was providing. So that's the huge takeaway. If you want to get good at communication and influence, you're going to have to understand number one, simple is the new sexy. This is Brant's words, not mine. In other words, we're so used to being bombarded with so much information that you got to be concise and clear and let them draw their conclusion based on that information. And number two, you've got to believe it yourself in order to communicate it. Fire.
Brant, Brant is uh, an interesting character, yeah. to say the least. All right, last two. Last two. This is my personal favorite. This is the thing that I have taken from the podcast, from the traveling, from the coaching calls, from the console to everything. Everything I've done over the last however many years it's been. Be afraid and do it anyway. That is the one thing that has gotten me. Like, guys, we've done 22 weeks of this. I was terrified for the first 11. We've done 430 episodes. I was terrified for the first 150. I've done an illustrious number of speeches, six ish. <laughs> I've been, I've been terrified for every single one. It's not about whether or not you're afraid. It's about whether or not you can still do it. And you can, if you're afraid, that's a good thing. That means you're pushing your boundaries. Okay. Think of the stuff that you're not afraid. It's easy, right? I'm not afraid of this anymore. Like that's, it's been 56 minutes already. It goes by so fast because we're in flow because this is what we do. We've done this so often, but it wasn't always easy. I am afraid of a lot of things. I just do it anyway because it's so important to me. That's why you're going to lean on why power. That's why you have to remember why you started. If you're afraid, it's a good thing. Do it anyway. So powerful. So my uh, last- Tim loves that statement. Kevin. Thank you, Tim. I Tim, love you. Tim, I'm so grateful you came, by the way. This is absolutely- What time is it for you, man? You're, you're over in the UK. Uh, yeah, it's uh, just approaching midnight, so... <laughs> Savage. Savage on Labor Day, man. Thank yeah, you, man. Thank you for coming. So mine is simple. Life is about choices, but if you're not hyper-conscious, you're not choosing. What do I mean by that? I've often told the story of a hypothetical scenario. Let's say there's a mother and a two-year-old child, and God forbid the two-year-old runs into the street and gets hit by a car. Okay, there's three people in the scenario. There's the driver of the car, there's the mother, and there's the child. Here's what I know for sure. It's not the child's fault. It's the mother who wasn't watching the child, or it's the driver, or both. Now, fault is different than responsibility. I'm not trying to have semantics. Here's what I know. Why is it definitely not the child's fault? Because the child was not aware that cars are dangerous. If you have high awareness and you're in hyperconscious nation, so I know that you have high awareness, guess what? It is your responsibility to make positive choices. If you are aware that you should exercise every day for your good health and don't, that's on you. And here's what I'll tell you. Learn more. Raise your awareness. That's what this podcast has done for us more than anything else. All of this. Everything in this mastermind tonight, the top 10 takeaways from 430 episodes, is trying to raise your awareness. Why? So that you can make better choices. The difference between me at 31 and me at 21 is that I make way better choices now. Trust me. And so if you're out there right now, I'll tell you what, money doesn't buy happiness. External validation doesn't buy happiness. Material things doesn't buy happiness. Good choices do. Good choices buy happiness and fulfillment and joy and love. Bad choices will always be something you're going to regret. And I think that one of the main things Kevin and I want you to go home with tonight is the fact that raising your awareness is critical because there's opportunities out there that you could choose, but you're not aware of them. And that's what this podcast has done for us and hopefully does for you. It's raised our awareness. Every, time, every one of these people on this board raised our awareness. So now we can make better choices. And all of the success we've had is, is because of that. And the other thing too is literally one thing can change your life. One of these takeaways, if you like really put it into your life, any of them, if you go home tonight or if you wake up tomorrow, if you're Tim and you go to sleep because it's midnight <laughs> and you wake up tomorrow and realize it is my spiritual obligation, right? As a human being, it is my job to make more money so I can help more people. And you reframe sales that way could change your life. Something that simple. Be, care of, be careful of your labels. If you've been the shy person your entire life, you can shift that. That could change your entire life. One bit of knowledge can change your entire life if you put it into practice. And we're trying to bring those every single week. Like if we could do more content, we would. But there's only so many podcast episodes you can hammer out in a weekend. Uh, honestly, I appreciate you guys from the bottom of my heart for joining us tonight. Labor Day, no days off for the team. I really appreciate all of you showing up. We weren't sure what the showing would be on Labor Day, but you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for coming. Also, Kevin and I talked about a PDF, a digital asset of each of these takeaways that we're going to create or co-create. And we're going to send that to you. So we have this video recorded. So we'll go back and we'll make sure we know who, who attended tonight and make sure that you all get that digital asset. And if you weren't able to take notes because you're on your phone or walking or whatever, uh, you'll have that. Any questions before we go? I want to make sure we housekeep. Silence.
Thank you, AK. Thank you, AK. Or should I say XA? Your, your thing says mobile XA. Mauricio, what's up? More, more of a statement, guys. Not, not, not much of a question, but going sure. back to uh, where you said, guys, a while ago, where it says make sure all the people in your life are in your life for all the right reasons. So I'm definitely glad to have met you guys and have worked with you guys and have your podcast. So definitely would like to say that you guys are in my life for all the right reasons. I've definitely grown a lot and have learned a lot from you guys in the past short two months that we've worked together and stuff like that. So thank definitely you. Appreciate thank you guys that. for that. Appreciate that. That's thank why we do it. Thank you so much, brother. You have no idea what that means. Thank you for taking the time to say that. Seriously. Young hustler. We, young people getting after it. That's, you know, it doesn't matter. <laughs> At the end of the day, like I wish, again, Mark Metry's 23. Mauricio is super young. I wish I knew this stuff when I was 20, 25. Like any time earlier <laughs> than when I did, right? Like the compound effect so oh, I did there, yeah. of understanding this will change your life. And the fact that we get to do it with you guys, so much gratitude, so much love. Anything else? And, uh, I do want to remind everybody, especially those of you listening to this after the fact, that we're now opening up the room at 530. So from 530 to 6, we're not being recorded. And you can get together with other people in Hyperconscious Nation that are like-minded, trying to grow themselves as well. Uh, we just started this, so a lot of people don't know yet, but uh, you can get on in early. Thank you, for that, Natalie. I did a poll in Hyperconscious Nation. What is the biggest thing you need more of? And almost everybody said building a network, like networking, building relationships, whatever it may be. That's why we did this. We want you guys to get to know each other, follow each other on social media, link up if you guys can help each other with work, uh, accountability buddies, workout buddies, whatever it may be. We're trying to build up a, a tight-knit community of people who want to become the most hyperconscious versions of themselves. Build your tribe. Thank you, Holly, for those kind words as well in the chat. And if you guys aren't on Hyperconscious Nation on Facebook yet, feel free to join because that is where we have all the people connecting to each other as well. Right on. For that, you can go to the hyperconsciouspodcast.com. There's a button at the very top. And again, Tiff designed that website. So if you need a website design, Tiffany's your gal. And thank you all. We want to end on time. So thank you, Natalie. Thank you, team. Thank you, Tiffany. Huge shout out to Amy as well for sending those messages. She's been so, so helpful at making sure these are valuable. So I wanted to say that even though she couldn't be here tonight. Thank you all so much. Reach out and we will talk to you soon. Love you.